Good morning, everyone. I'm Sarita Fry I'm at the University of New Hampshire, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's been a really interesting and informative week so far. Um, by way of introduction, I'm a microbial ecologist and ecosystem ecologist I'm interested in how microbial communities are responding to disturbance um, from both a structural and functional standpoint. Um, and I'm particularly interested in how shifts in microbial communities in response to disturbance feedback to influence ecosystem scale processes. Um, Anthony tasked me with um, giving a presentation today on the long-term global change experiments at Harvard Forest, which is a long-term ecological research site in central Massachusetts here in the Northeastern um, part of the United States um, here under the gold um, star. Harvard Forest has a long history of um, large experiments and permanent plot studies, some of which go back to the beginning of the LTER um, program in the late 80s, so 1987, 1988. Given the theme of this workshop, I'm going to focus on this set of experiments at the bottom here that are manipulation experiments. I don't have time today to focus on all of the uh, manipulation experiments at Harvard Force, but I thought I would just quickly um, highlight a number of them for those of you that may be interested. Um, and so um, one of the longest running ones uh, is the hurricane manipulation experiment, which was established in 1990 to simulate the 1938 hurricane that um, came through New England, particularly Massachusetts. Um, and so this experiment is, was really designed to look at forest recovery following a disturbance of that type. More recently, in the early 2000s, the Hemlock removal experiment was initiated to look at the impacts of Hemlock dieback in response to invasion by um, the Hemlock woolly adelgid. And a few years later, in the mid 2000s, the ungulate exclusion um, experiment was initiated to look at the role of deer and moose browsing on um, forest structure and function. But what I'm going to focus on today are a set of experiments that my group currently manages um, focused on um, long term soil warming and soil nitrogen enrichment. And the first of these is a set of long-term chronic soil warming experiments um, that have been initiated um, at different time points, which means that they um, in some ways represent a chrono sequence because we have um, plots that have been heated in the same way um, on the same soil type under similar vegetation. Um, all of these plots are heated continuously to five degrees C above ambient. Um, with underground um, heating cables. Um, and I did want to just note that Jerry Malillo, who's um, recently retired, um, initiated the first two experiments in 1991 and 2002. Um, and my group started a third experiment in 2006. And I'll talk a little bit about why that was in a moment. Um, I would just highlight here that this image in the background, what we're looking at is um, a photo um, taken from a nearby walk-up tower in late winter, and so you're looking through the tree canopy um, uh, onto the ground, and you can see um, that the bare plots are the heated plots, which at this time of year lose their snow cover um, a little bit earlier than the control plots, which are still um, snow covered. The chronic nitrogen amendment study um, was initiated by John Aber in 1988, so at the beginning um, of the LTER as well, so it's been running for longer than 30 years now. Um, and this is a set of um, mega plots, so 30 by 30 meter plots that are unreplicated, um, but that represent three different nitrogen fertilization treatments, um, and historically um, two different um, stands were represented, a pine stand and a hardwood stand. Um, the pine stand needed to be discontinued in 2008 following a severe ice storm and um, the damage that was caused by that event. 
So after studying microbial and soil biogeochemical responses to the single factor experiments, so single factor uh, warming um, or single factor nitrogen addition, um, and seeing very different and um, in fact contrasting results, um, we thought it was important to uh, set up an experiment where we could look at these um, two factors um, together um, and, and look at their interactions. And so Alex Contasta, a PhD student in my lab, initiated this experiment in 2006, which is a, a two-factor experiment with warming and nitrogen addition um, and their combination um, in a multifactorial design. So this workshop is on whole ecosystem manipulations. And I have been talking with you about soil treatments or soil manipulations. And so when I was initially approached by Anthony to give this presentation, I was a little bit hesitant as to what insights, um, you know, our soil manipulation experiments might provide um, to a workshop focused on whole ecosystem experiments. But after giving it a little bit more thought and um, hearing the conversations this week, I think there are a few takeaways or a few lessons learned from our work at Harvard Forest that can be um, relevant to the discussions that we're having this week. And the first insight that I'd like to share is again, that of time and the importance of long-term experiments um, and uh, I think the reality that early results are often not the story. And so my example of that comes from the oldest soil warming experiment that Jerry Malillo initiated in 1991. Um, and here I'm showing um, soil respiration, which is the kind of the main ecosystem measurement that we make um, regularly. Um, and here's the data that Jerry published in 2002. So this was after 10 years of warming, showing uh, the, the difference in soil respiration between the heated plots and the control plots, um, showing what you would expect, this initial um, uh, increase in soil respiration in the heated plots relative to con the control. But then um, after a few years, showing this steady decline towards the baseline, um, uh, after which point the heated plots were no longer um, respiring uh, differentially relative to the control. And the um, conclusion that Jerry um, and his collaborators made in this 2002 paper was that, you know, whereas soil warming accelerates soil organic matter decay and carbon dioxide fluxes to the atmosphere, this response is short-lived for a mid-latitude forest because of the limited size of the labile soil carbon pool. Um, and this was a common finding in a, in, a, in a large number of experiments, many of which had only run for often for five years or less, but certainly for 10 years or less. If we go out another five years, uh, we see that there is this period of stasis um, here where, again, the, um, the, the respiratory response between the heated plots and the controls is similar. Um, but then something interesting starts to happen around year 15 where we start to see a bump up again in soil respiration in the heated plots. And if you continue this out another 10 years, you see that this, um, this wave, the second wave, if you will, of soil respiration continues through about year 25 when it again starts to decline towards baseline. And so um, over this 25 year period, we see this cyclic pattern in soil respiration. Um, and so the conclusion in our 2017 paper was quite different from that of the of of the 2002 paper, right? So um, here we concluded that our results support projections of a long-term self-reinforcing carbon feedback from mid-latitude forests to the climate system as the world warm, warms, keeping in mind that this is a soil response, not a whole ecosystem response, right? So this is just focused on that um, carbon stock uh, that is potentially lost um, with warming. But the point here is that 
if we had stopped the experiment or if Jerry had stopped the experiment at 10 years, which is the norm, um, we would have a very different um, perspective on what's happening um, with soil respiration uh, in, this, in this ecosystem. So because I expect there are questions about what might be driving this cyclic pattern, I would just um, very quickly um, summarize kind of the, the working hypothesis, which is that warming causes cycles of soil carbon decay punctuated by periods of structural and functional changes in the microbial community, which then leads to another phase of enhanced respiratory response um, due to warming. Um, and there is some evidence for this hypothesis. So we see in this kind of first wave or first phase of respiration, a reduction in labile carbon, a decline in microbial biomass, a decline in uh, microbial use of simple carbon substrates, and an overall loss of about 17% of the total soil carbon stock. Um, and when we go out to this later or second phase of respiration, um, we see that the community, the microbial community has shifted. We see um, an uh, increase in the number of taxa or relative abundance of taxa with the capacity to degrade organic matter. So we see increased bacterial capacity to degrade cellulose, an increased number of fungal taxa expressing lignin degrading genes. And this is associated with an increased, um, with increased lignin use and a, a decline in um, the relative abundance of lignin. Okay, so a few thoughts on multi-factor experiments. So I mentioned earlier that after studying uh, microbial and biogeochemical responses in the single factor experiments, um, we became right, quite interested in um, what we would see um, when looking at the interactions between nitrogen and warming, because we were seeing quite contrasting results, as I said, um, in those two single factor experiments. Um, and so we set up this multi-factor experiment, and I'm showing um, the first uh, 13 years of data here, again, um, using annual CO2 flux, soil CO2 flux as our ecosystem um, parameter. And um, if we look first at the, at the middle bars, the orange bars, um, these are the heated only plots, and we see you know, exactly what we'd expect, that is an enhanced respiratory response that is concomitant with significant soil carbon loss. If we look at nitrogen alone, which is the, the bottom green bars, we see an initial stimulation of respiration with um, nitrogen fertilization. But after a few years, um, that, res that respiratory response um, goes to below or at um, the control level. Um, and if our work in the long term um, chronic nitrogen amendment experiment is any indication. Um, this nitrogen only treatment will uh, ultimately show a suppression of soil respiration and an accumulation of soil carbon. What became quite interesting to us was that in plots where we have both warming and nitrogen, we see, and that's the top pink bars, we see this high and sustained respiratory response. Um, well above that of heating alone, and that doesn't appear to be ameliorated by this suppression or this reduction in respiration when you have nitrogen alone. Um, and we don't understand fully the, the, the mechanisms underlying these patterns, but I have a, a graduate student, Thomas Muratori, who's digging into this. Um, and it's shaping up to be, I think, um, a root mycorrhizal interaction story, which I think is going to be quite interesting. So we should have um, a better handle on what's um, driving these patterns in another year or so. So my third insight is simply an example of how we can use these um, long-term global change experiments to look at compound disturbances. And in this example, um, we um, imposed a, a biotic invasion as a pulse disturbance on top of our long-term warming and nitrogen addition treatments, so uh, the press um, disturbance. 
Um, and in this case, this was work done by uh, Mark Anthony, who was a graduate student in my lab. Um, he uh, artificially invaded our long-term warming and nitrogen addition plots with um, an invasive plant with garlic mustard, which is a common understory invasive in the Northeast and a plant that is highly disruptive to underground um, microbial communities, particularly um, the fungal community. Um, and so Mark was interested in how uh, this pulse uh, event, it was only a, a, a one growing season, how this pulse invasion on top of this press um, might influence the fungal response. And without getting into a lot of the details for lack of time, he found that warming, so the, the press of warming, did exacerbate um, the fungal response to plant invasion, the pulse event. And he did not see this um, either in the nitrogen um, treatment plots or in the ambient plots. My insight number four is related to a topic that I really haven't heard discussed much, if at all, this week, and that is the role of evolution in organism responses to disturbance. Um, this is an area that I think is woefully understudied and underappreciated and one that I hope is going to gain greater traction um, going forward. I'm going to give just a simple example of how we've begun to examine this um, uh, from a microbial context at Harvard Forest. And this is um, a study that we did looking at um, saprotrophic or decomposer fungi um, growing in the chronic nitrogen amendment plots. So in this experiment, we isolated um, fungi that we know are important decomposers of organic material in these soils. And here I'm showing um, a single species, Urpex lacteus, which is an important decomposer at our site. Um, and we isolated, in this case, urpex um, from both the control and the nitrogen amended plot. So we had control isolates that had not been exposed to nitrogen enriched soils for 20 years versus isolates from the nitrogen treatment plots that had been exposed for multiple decades to um, enriched nitrogen conditions. Um, and in a nutshell, what we found is that the capacity for the nitrogen isolates um, to decompose organic matter was lower compared to that for the control isolates of the same species. Um, and this response was not readily reversed when these nitrogen isolates were grown in control envi environments. And so our data do suggest that populations growing in nitrogen-enriched um, soils um, have evolved and are less able to decay um, organic matter than populations of the same species um, growing in control plots. And so I think this begs the question as to um, how these organisms will then be able to respond to subsequent di uh, disturbance in the future. So just a few parting thoughts before I let you go. Um, the first is that uh, long-term manipulative experiments should be, well, long-term. That is, they should be as long as possible uh, because of those surprises um, that I talked about. Um, long, these long-term experiments also provide, I think, interesting opportunities to do a few things. They um, provide opportunities to look at compound disturbance, so pulse on press, for example. Um, but they also, as I talked about in the last slide, offer um, a very unique opportunity, I think, to investigate and record evolutionary responses in the field. Um, and to that end, I guess I would really encourage us as ecologists and um, ecosystem scientists and modelers to engage more broadly with evolutionary biologists um, who can help us think about um, how best to look at um, uh, evolutionary change in the context of these manipulative experiments, and in particular, whether evolutionary mechanisms are important to incorporate into models. Um, and then finally, just a few additional knowledge gaps that I've been thinking about this week. Um, you know, we certainly heard with Lindsay's talk um, about uh, ice storms, 
Um, so that's certainly, a, a, you know, a winter dynamic. But one thing we haven't heard that much about or talked that much about this week are things like freeze thaw cycles, um, which we would expect to, to become much more common, particularly in northern latitudes um, as snowpack or snow cover starts to decline. I mean, also looking at things like, you know, this idea of winter weather whiplash. Um, we also haven't talked much about deep soil carbon and, um, you know, what's going to happen to the very large stock of deep soil carbon as these soils, uh, as deeper soils start to warm over the next um, several decades. We have talked a bit, uh, 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 quite a bit, I guess, th this week about below ground processes, but I would just like to, I guess, reiterate um, or highlight that we are still, I think, woefully behind or behind the curve, if you will, on understanding below ground processes, um, particularly as it relates to roots, um, plant carbon allocation below ground, um, and microbe mineral organic matter interactions. So just putting in another plug for below ground processes. Okay, thank you very much for your time.